All right, here we go. Today's lecture, we're going to talk about control of the cell cycle. Um, so, first of all, the timing and the rate of cell division in different parts of plant and animal cells is crucial to normal growth and development and maintenance. Okay, so the frequency of cells dividing is different for different cell types. So I'm sure that you guys know, for instance, that skin cells divide constantly. Why? Because of constant wear and tear, they're constantly needing to be replaced and, rep and repaired and they're sloughed off constantly. Um, some cells, like liver cells, for example, um, are only going to be replaced whenever they're damaged. So they're not going to you know, divide as often as, let's say, a skin cell. And then there are other cells in the body, like nerve cells and cardiac muscle cells, or even mature muscle cells, that rarely, if ever, divide, um, although there are some research that's showing that some people do have the ability to, to replace those, but for the most part, um, they rarely, if ever, divide. So the question kind of arises as, you know, what makes some cells divide more often than others? So it's known that the mechanisms for regulating this are at the molecular level and that there's definitely things in the cytoplasm that regulate the dividing of the cell. So there are certain controls and as you can see here, um, some of them are internal and then on the next slide there are some that are external in nature. So I'm going to go ahead and um, put this in full slide view if I can right here. Okay, never mind, cancel that, whatever. Okay, <laughs> anyway. <coughs> So we're going to get this in full um, view here so we can write on this. Um, I kind of have a lot of notes for you to take on this one slide, so I don't know if you have an extra sheet of paper or if you want to just write on the bottom of this, but I'm going to be drawing like a lot of stuff on this one slide because there's a lot of important information in here. And if I, at any point I go too fast for you, um, I do encourage you to read this part in your book because there's a lot of good stuff. I'm not even going to go over the experiment, but there were a couple of experiments that were conducted in the 1970s that are really interesting um, with this and kind of leading up to the control of the cell cycle. So, of course, the question is what? Okay, what controls? That's the ultimate question is um, what controls the cell cycle? Um, one hypothesis was that, you know, that one event leads to the next, that when the cell goes through G1, that leads to then the cell wanting to go through S, and that leads to it wanting to go through G2. But it wasn't long before scientists discovered that that was not definitely not what caused cells to switch to different parts of the cell cycle. Um, in fact, in the 1970s, there was a really cool experiment done where they took cells and introduced them with each other, like fused them together. So they had one, let's say, that was in the S phase, and they fused it with one that was in G1. And what they quickly discovered was that this one that was in S phase had a huge impact on this one in G1 and put it in the S phase. So it had like a huge impact. So they were studying, you know, what's present inside the cell in the cytoplasm that would make this one influence it and put it into the S phase. And they did the same thing with one that was in M and they fused it with one that was in G1 and they noticed that quickly the one that was in M influenced this one that was in G1 to go straight into M and skip S altogether. And so there's definitely influential um, things, chemicals that lead cells to, um, you know, go and divide and, and lead to, to them. So there's something that I, I want you to write down here, and there's a distinct what we call cell cycle control system. Okay, there's definitely a cell cycle control system. It's a cyclically operating set of molecules in the cell that both triggers and coordinates key events in the cell cycle. And the book it kind of attributes this, which I thought was funny because I don't even know if you guys wash your own clothes, but they contributed it and um, they kind of related it to the dial on your washing machine. Okay, so if you guys wash your own clothes, you know that on the washing machine, you're going to push the button down and you're going to choose a certain setting on there and then you pull the knob out. And you know that the washing machine is responding to internal and external cues. Like, for instance, the washer's not going to start agitating your clothes until the tub is filled up with water to the, the maximum amount that it needs. So there's certain cues along the way that would regulate the washing machine to do its things, just like in this picture, they kind of use the same dial because there's a cell cycle control system that responds, or that, or excuse me, that controls the phases that the, the cell cycle is going to be in. So I thought, thought that was kind of cool. So there's built-in signals that both stop and go. They, they do stop and go points. Um, within the cell cycle to kind of make it do what it's going to do. So that's what these little um, molecules are. So first thing I also want to make you to note here is when you see the word checkpoint, a checkpoint is a control point 
where there is a stop, which you can see in this picture they put a stoplight. So there's a stop and a go ahead. Okay, that's the two things. There's a stop and a go ahead signal. So uh, different checkpoints and the three major ones that are in the cell cycle is there's one at G1, there's one at G2, and there's one at M. Those are the three major checkpoints and the M is the mitotic phase. Okay, so those three checkpoints are where the cell is going to have a stop and go ahead signal to let it know kind of, you know, what it's going to do. And the interesting thing is the, the stop signals are the built-in mechanisms, and the cell doesn't go past it unless it reaches a go point, a go-ahead point. So the stop is kind of like the first signal that's present, and it will only go past that if it has enough of certain chemicals to give it the go-ahead signal to do that. Okay, so um, that's kind of in animal cells. That's usually um, what we have are those, those stop signals. Now, um, like I said, the three checkpoints are G1, G2, and M. And then the cell, when it first gets to the G1, I would put right here, this is the most important checkpoint. G1 is, is the most important. And, and if the cell passes that, it has a nickname, by the way, called the restriction point. If the cell passes that restriction point, it knows it's pretty much going to go ahead. And in most cases, it goes and, and goes past that and goes into S goes into G2, goes into M, completes the mitotic phase, and splits into two cells. So that's why this first, G, this first checkpoint is the most important, um, and they call it the restriction point. So basically, okay, you've got G1, and a cell is in this part of the cell cycle, and it's gone around. Okay, if it has enough of the internal cues that lets it go past that checkpoint, it will continue and go through S, which means it's going to double the DNA. It will then go through G2, which means it's going to double the organelles and double the centrioles, and then it's ready to move into the mitotic phase. Okay, if it doesn't receive the go-ahead signal, if it says no, you get a red light here, and we're not going to go past that, the cell goes into an alternative little subphase called G sub zero. Okay, so it's going to go to G sub zero. This means that it's not dividing. It's entering like a resting period. Okay, it's called a resting state. But know that some cells that enter into G sub zero can actually re-enter the cycle back on the other side of G1 and go into S if, if need be. Perfect example is most of your liver cells are actually in G sub zero. They're in resting state. The only reason your, your liver cell would come out of G sub zero and then go into the rest of the cell cycle is if it were damaged and the need arise that it needed to start dividing again. Okay, so a skin cell, for example, is not going to be in G sub zero very long. I'm not saying it can't be, but if it is, it's not going to be there very long until it's called out of that to go back into the cell cycle. Okay, a cardiac muscle cell, okay, a cardiac muscle cell or a nerve cell, okay, theoretically, by all sense and purposes, those technically do not divide. This is according to research purposes. So those type of cells would remain in G sub zero and would probably never enter back past that checkpoint to go into the cell cycle. Okay, so that's why that's the most important um, checkpoint is that restriction point. The one that's in G2, okay, that, that's basically a checkpoint seeing if the cell has everything that it needs to before it enters into the M phase because once it gets into the M phase, that's mitotic, it's going to go through prophase, prometa, meta, ana, tele, and cytokinesis. So it's got to make sure everything is appropriately um, there, like it's got enough organelles, it's got enough cytoplasm to support the cells. So that's another checkpoint. Okay, the M checkpoint, actually the most important place in that is metaphase. Okay, and during metaphase, the cell does what I call a head count, where when you've got the sister chromatids all lined up in the middle of the cell, the cell is really making sure that all of the DNA is attached and ready to go because once it goes past meta and it goes into anaphase, that's when they pull apart. And so we've got to make sure that the spindle fibers and the mitotic uh, fibers are all ready to go through the anaphase part because once they do that, they're going to pull apart. So that's why that's the third checkpoint is right there at metaphase. Okay, so now we're going to get into some specifics, talking about some internal signaling down here at the bottom, where we're going to um, talk about the cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDK. So I'm going to erase what I have here because I need more room to actually write what I'm about to write. But you might want to, I don't know, use a piece of paper or use the bottom of your notes. It doesn't matter. But I'm going to get rid of this. Okay, and I'm going to go back to this. And let me see if I can get this to go up like this. All right, cool. I'm so tech savvy. It's awesome.
Sorry, so anyway, um, so regulating the cell cycle, okay, there's, there's two major, um, I don't know, which, I guess you want to call them chemicals, there's two major chemicals that regulate the cell cycle. So I'm going to use this space up here because I need more space to write, so kind of ignore this for right now. Because there's two things that are going to help regulate the cell cycle. One are called kinases, okay, these kinases. These drive the cell cycle, and they're actually, you can see down here, they're fa in fairly constant concentration during the cell cycle. So in other words, they act there are actually a lot of them that are present. However, they're not all active at the same time. So we've got a fair amount of, of these kinases um, that are there during the cell cycle. But to be active, they must have something called cyclins present. Okay? Now, a cyclin is a protein as well. These are both proteins. And actually, that's an enzyme you can tell by AFE. But it's a protein, a cyclin, and it got its name because it's cyclically fluctuating the concentration in the cell. Um, but these cyclins work with these kinases. Okay, so the name that we give these are, there are some called cyclin-dependent kinases because these are kinases that are dependent on the concentration of cyclin that's present in the cell cycle. So we nickname these, because who wants to sit there and say cyclin-dependent kinases? So it's much easier to say CDKs. So we call these enzymes that regulate the cell cycle, we call them CDKs. Okay, so their job is to regulate the moving from one phase to the next. Okay, so they're activated, these kinases are activated whenever they are bound to a cyclin molecule. If they're not bound to a cyclin, they're, they're in inactive form. They're still there, but they're not doing anything. Okay, so that's why it says the kinase concentration is fairly constant, because they might be there, but they might not be attached to a cyclin. Only are they activated when they are attached to a cyclin, okay? Now, the concentration does vary um, of these depending on where you're at in the cycle. So I'm just going to do a little hypothetical scenario here to kind of let you know um, how these work, okay? And I'm going to use shapes to show, to show you this, okay? So I'm going to use a little triangle to illustrate a CDK. Okay, CDK is the kinase. So I'm using a little triangle here. Okay, I'm trying to come up with a cool shape. Then I'm going to use a different shape, let's say a flat little curvy thing to represent cyclin. Okay, so that's cyclin and that's kinase. Alright, so those are the two things. So basically, what's going to happen is um, in, like, right in S phase, Okay, there's the synthesis of cyclin begins, so your, your cell will actually make cyclin in late S phase because the cell knows that it just doubled the DNA. If we're doubling the DNA, that's, a, that's kind of a little response, gives it an internal cue for your cell to start sy synthesizing some of these cyclins. Okay, so it continues, it goes in S, and in G2, the cell will start synthesizing some of these cyclins. Okay, because cyclin is protected and it can't degrade, it's going to accumulate. So you can imagine you've got a bunch of these cyclins. And I'm not a very good artist, but just go with me here. So a bunch of those accumulate. Okay. Now, it combines with the CDKs that are there. Okay, so there's the kinases. So each one of these binds. So each one of them will have a triangular top that adds to it. Now, when that binds, this thing right here now becomes a functional unit. And they gave it a name, it's kind of weird, but it's called an MPS. Okay, it's called an MPS. So this is now a functional unit. Now the M stands for maturity or maturation. The P is promoting factor. Okay, so it's a maturation promoting factor. It's promoting the cell to like mature and go into the next part of the cell cycle. Um, some scientists kind of laugh and instead of saying maturation promoting factor, they'll call it like M phase promoting factor because it's promoting the cell to move into the M phase. So once you've got these units like this, these MPFs, which once again is kinase plus its cyclin, so these are CDKs that are now bound to these cyclin molecules. Okay, once they accumulate, what they do is they cause the, in, during the mitotic part, or excuse me, during between this, like right in here in G2, Okay, they cause the cell to pass G2 and move into the M phase. Okay, so if enough of those are in high concentration. Now, if you don't have enough of those in high enough concentration, then the cell doesn't have that internal cue for it to move past that checkpoint. So that kind of allows it to go past this red checkpoint right here and move into M. Okay, now, once it's in M, okay, this little MPS complex right here 
is going to promote mitosis to happen. So it's going to promote it to go into prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, etc. And the activity of this, this complex, actually peaks during metaphase. Okay, so metaphase, it, it peaks. The reason being is that's the point at which the DNA is lined up in the middle, and the next thing we're going to do is pull that DNA apart. Okay, so the, the concentration of those is kind of high at that point. Okay, once it passes M and goes into Anna, okay, so you can kind of see there's another checkpoint in here. It's the next red one. Okay, then at that point, your little complex, your little triangle and this little thing, the little triangle starts to break down. Okay, so the, actually it's the cyclin, sorry, my bad. It's the <laughs> bottom part. The cyclin starts to break down. Okay, once the cyclin breaks down, the bottom part, it degrades, now you have your kinase that's by itself, and it can continue to be recycled and can be used again later on, but the, the cyclin is broken down, meaning that there's no more signal going on, so it kind of ends the, the M phase and promotes the cell to go into G1. So it's the presence of these, um, these CDKs when they're attached to cyclins that initiate the cell to move from one phase to the next. Okay, so those are internal signals that help that happen. Okay, so if you're confused on that, read it in the book. The book does a really good explanation of it. I try to just touch the surface. All right, so next part. There are external signals that also will signal the cell cycle, some controls that do this. And um, what they've discovered is that there are certain growth factors that can be released by certain cells that can stimulate other cells to also divide. Um, in this, what they notice is that, um, like in cases of uh, PDGF, which you see right here, PDGF is a special type of platelet um, type of growth factor that it's called platelet-derived growth factor. And um, in some people, this is when it's present. For example, you make more platelets, and that's in response to this growth factor that, that's present at that time. Erythropoietin is another one that causes the production of red blood cells. And so these are external signals on the outside that one cell can have, and the presence of that can touch like the receptor sites on the next cell and signal that to then start, um, start dividing if need be. All right, un momento. Okay, so if you look at this diagram, it's kind of cool. Um, it's showing you that, let me see if I can move it up a little bit. Um, and this is kind of a blown up version, but you can see that these are little receptors right here, and it's on the cell, so it's like big green cell right here, it's a target cell. So here's your producer cell, and I have no idea why that's doubled right there, but anyway. Um, here's your producer cell, and you can see it's producing these little growth factors, the little red things. So they go across and they stimulate this cell, the target cell, to then divide whenever those molecules are present. Well, one of the cool things that they've used this for is um, the manufacturing of platelets. Um, they've actually, they did this study where they took, and it's kind of gross, but they took like a sample of human tissue, and then they chopped it up with a scalpel into a bazillion pieces, and then they um, used some enzymes to digest everything in there so that, so that it, all it had were these things called fibroblasts. And um, fibroblasts were, were supposed to be able to regenerate like more platelets. But then they took them and put them in two Petri dishes. One Petri dish was not treated with this PDGF, this growth, fact growth factor. The other Petri dish was treated with that growth factor. And of course, the one that was treated with it produced massive, I mean massive, massive amounts of um, these little bitty platelets, um, which had these fibroblasts in it. So it's a way to kind of generate uh, platelets. And they also were able to discover that definitely uh, these external signals, one cell can have an impact on another cell by releasing certain signals that can tell it to do it. So it's kind of like cell signaling. So that's kind of cool. Okay, um, moving on now to um, at these other external signals. There's two types of um, impact, like two, two different things that can have an impact on cells dividing externally. One is called density dependent inhibition, and the other one is anchor, anchor, ugh, I can never say it, anchorage dependence. And so both of these are kind of cool. The, the first one, density dependent, just look what it says, density dependent inhibition. So this results from crowded conditions. Um, normally cells will divide until they are totally touching each other, and then once they start touching each other, cell division stops. So what you can see, like in this bottom picture, let me move this over a little bit, um, you can see that the cells in this little um, segment right here, they have divided until they are like all touching each other. 
but what they've done before is they've taken some cells out, so you can see this little scalpel coming in here. If you cut some out, they will divide until they fill that gap in, but then once they fill the gap in, they know, okay, they're going to stop dividing at that point, so they're not going to overgrow, because if they keep overgrowing, then you've got crowded cells in that area. So that's density-dependent inhibition. So what controls that, though, um, is the same thing. There are uh, different types of signals that are sent from one cell to the next. So once they create that layer along the surface, um, there are signals that are sent out that tell the cells to stop dividing. And the only way that they'll start dividing is if something happens like this where cells are removed and then the, the signal is sent out for them to start dividing. And um, the next one is Anchorage dependence. Most animal cells exhibit Anchorage dependence. Um, which is, in order for them to divide, they must be attached to a substratum, which it can be in our body to a, to a, a surface in the, in the body, but it could also be if you're growing them in culture, like what you see in this picture. They must be attached to, like, the inside of a culture jar or to a petri dish or some type of extracellular matrix of a tissue. And so um, experiments suggest that, like, cell density anchors a signal to the cell cycle control system via pathways involving the cell membrane proteins and elements of a cytoskeleton. So um, both, excuse me, both density-dependent inhibition and anchorage dependence appear to function in body tissues as well as in cell culture, checking the growth of cells at some optimal density and location. What's interesting, though, and we'll, we'll talk about this in just a second, is that cancer cells exhibit neither density-dependent inhibition nor anchorage-dependence, which is why cancer cells are so, you know, scary in what they do and have uncontrollable just cell division because they don't respond to these normal external signaling molecules. Cancer cells don't care that they're supposed to just be one layer of cells. They just keep dividing, dividing, dividing and can have, like, you know, massive uncontrolled growth, and they also do not have to have something to attach to. They can actually just keep dividing on their own. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. Okay, let's talk about cancer um, for a second. I know that a lot of you have probably been affected by this or had a family member affected by cancer. So um, let's talk about this. Uh, cancer cells, the reason that they are so um, dangerous and scary is because they do not respond to the normal cell controls. They don't respond to the checkpoints. Um, they basically just def divide excessively Okay, without responding to any checkpoints. And if unchecked, they can actually kill the organism. I'm sure you guys know um, people who have been affected by cancer. Um, in culture, they do not stop dividing when growth factors are depleted, which is unlike normal cells. Um, a lot of hi a logical hypothesis is that cancer cells do not need growth factors in their culture medium in order to grow and divide. They may make a required growth factor themselves, or they may have an abnormality in the signaling pathway that convey conveys the growth factor signal to the cell cycle control system. So basically you're looking at cells that something goes wrong in the cell, somehow the DNA is mutated. Okay, so there's a faulty cell mechanism, the, the cell is faulty in some way. And so instead of that cell doing what it should do, which is this word, it's called apoptosis, one of my favorite words ever in science. Apoptosis is like a cell suicide. It's a programmed cell death. You actually want your cells to do this, guys. So if your DNA in a cell, so here's a cell, and the DNA is inside the nucleus, if it were mutated somehow, you would want the cell to avoid dividing. You'd want it to go through a programmed cell death and use its lysosomes and release hydrolytic enzymes and basically chew up that cell and get rid of it. You'd want, to, want it to do that. A cancer cell does not do that. A cancer cell, for whatever reason, ignores all the checkpoints along the way, does not go through apoptosis or programmed cell death, instead goes through uncontrollable cell growth and cell division, and not only is it like controlling excessively, it's depriving normal cells in the environment of their nutrients because they, they're so massively like dividing that they're needing all the nutrients themselves. So you can see in this picture below, this is a colon cancer, and um, you can see that there's three different stages. I'm sure you guys have heard of staging before. So the staging not only has to do with how big the tumor is, okay, and a tumor is a collection of cancer cells. And of course, the tumor can be localized, like in this picture. This is the mass right here. That's the tumor mass. 
And you can see that it's slightly in the lining of the large intestine right here. It's kind of a bulging out. It's kind of like a polyp. In the next picture, you can see it's bigger. Okay, so we move on to stage two because it's a little bit bigger and you can see the blood kind of seeping out. This picture right here, when you get to stage three, the blood is coming out, meaning that some of these cells have the ability to do what we call metastasize. And metastasize means that pieces of these cells can break off, get into the bloodstream, travel around the body, and then go to a different location and anchor at a different location and then start dividing. So you might have somebody that you know, for instance, that starts off with breast cancer and they have a tumor, but then pieces of the cell break off and get into the bloodstream and it metastasizes and maybe goes to the lung or goes to the colon or goes to a different location because of metastasis, which is the spreading of those cells. Um, they can get, you know, tumor cells, cancer cells like this, can break off and, and get into lymph nodes. When you're dealing with lymph nodes, lymph nodes, are, their job is to fight infections. So if you've got cancer cells that are in the lymph nodes, you're usually dealing with stage 3 or even stage 4 cancer, which um, in most cases is you're dealing with chemotherapy and radiation in an effort to treat that. All right, so here's the next picture you can kind of see. There's your definition for tumor. Tumor is a mass of abnormal cells. Okay, you may have heard the words benign and malignant, and there's the metastasizing word I just went over. But if it's a benign tumor, that's best case scenario. That means the mass remains at its, its, at its original site. You can usually go in and operate and take a benign tumor out and um, get the margins, which are the borders around that tumor, and you're usually good to go. A lot of benign tumors, you don't need any kind of radiation or any kind of chemotherapy. You just remove those. Okay, if it's a malignant tumor, that means the tumor spreads to other parts of the body, you're usually dealing with radiation or chemotherapy in an effort to um, get rid of more cancer cells. Um, radiation, with that, you can treat one localized area. Like if somebody has cancer of the throat, you can do radiation of the throat cells where it's just targeting that area to try to kill those cells. Whereas if you do chemo, chemo is a toxic chemical that gets into the body and kills good cells as well as bad cells, which is why a lot of people get sick from chemotherapy. Okay, metastasis, that's the word that means the cancer cells have broken off from the tumor and travel through the circulatory system. So you can see in the picture here, this is a picture of breast cancer, and there's your tumor okay, in, in the first picture. So it grows from a single cancer cell that has mutated DNA, so you have a small tumor. Okay, it's, it's caught early enough, which early detection is the life-saving um, point for cancer, if caught early enough, if a woman feels this lump, or actually a man, because men can get breast cancer as well, then you can um, get that treated and have that removed. If it's not detected, you can see the second picture, that it invades neighboring cells and starts to starve the other cells of their nutrients. Okay, if it is large, like in the third picture, and it's metastasizing, those break off, and in the surrounding circulatory vessels and lymph vessels, those cells get into that fluid and travel to other parts of the body where it can, um, it can go into other locations. I do not know why I did that. Okay? All right, so that actually concludes our unit on controlling the cell cycle. I will do another lecture on um, meiosis. I'll start on this next slide next, but this is good for this one just to finish with control checkpoints. Okay? Make sure you do your reading and that is all. Have a good one.